Welcome Realtors. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Adair Sin and I'm a Realtor here in Greenville, South Carolina, and I serve as NAR's politi Federal Political Coordinator for Representative William Timmons. Thank you, Adair. I'm Owen Tyler, your 2020 President for South Carolina Realtors from Charleston. We're honored to have Representative Timmons here today and thank him for his leadership in Washington. Um, prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic. Uh, he has been a great supporter of the real estate industry and home ownership in not only his district, but South Carolina as a whole. Absolutely, thank you, Owen. May is the time of the year when we look forward to attending the NAR legislative meetings in Washington, DC. And I can honestly say it is my favorite meeting. Unfortunately, we're doing things remotely this year uh, because of the coronavirus. But it gives us a great opportunity to include more members. And so now all 24,000 of our realtor members have the opportunity to join into this discussion today. I hope the conversation you hear today inspires you to attend next year's meetings, which hopefully will be back in Washington, DC. Well, I hope we'll be back in Washington as well, Adair. It really is one of my favorite meetings. Uh, Representative Timmons, what you, what you may not know is we typically have 125 realtors from South Carolina that attend our week-long events. Uh, with the ability to do this via Zoom, we're able to stream to our 24,000 members and make that available so that people can go back and watch it uh, so that they really understand our interaction with you and your interaction with us in the real estate industry. So if you're ready, uh, we're going to kind of jump right into uh, to the schedule. I think everybody can see you're in the airport heading to D.C. to vote. Uh, so we don't want to keep you too long. Uh, we don't want you to miss your flight. So um, you ready to go? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry we're not doing this in person and hopefully we'll be able to get together soon. Um, uh, as you said, I am in the airport, so I apologize for any background noise. I'm going to be using my mute button uh, as, as effectively as possible. Um, really, I, I'll just give a quick update. So obviously, the last two months have been uh, new territory for all of us. Uh, the federal and the state governments doing everything they can to get through this crisis, get through the pandemic. And um, we've been taking the steps necessary to keep people safe. Flatten the curve, slow the spread. We've all heard it. Uh, so, you know, we're at a point now where we're coming out of it or hopefully coming out of it. We've got to reopen. Um, everyone has done their part, has, has stayed home whenever possible. But um, we've got to get back to work and we've got to do that safely. And we've got to do it in a structured and effective way. So, um, you know, I'm hoping that uh, Congress will get back to work. I'm hoping that my gym and my yoga studio will, will reopen and I'll be able to stop doing dishes. All I do is cook and clean at my house. And <laughs> I, 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 it was nice for a couple of weeks, but um, I really do not like doing the dishes. And that has been uh, uh, something I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, not doing anymore. We went to dinner last night at Northampton Wine, um, downtown Greenville. We sat outside. It was the first time we've been out to dinner and uh, nine weeks now. So, you know, we are going to get back uh, back to the new normal and I'm looking forward to it. So with that, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to represent the 4th Congressional District and I'm looking forward to answering any questions you may have. Right. Thank you. I have to agree with you. I am so tired of eating at home as someone who probably eats every meal out uh, literally 365 days a year. It's been a real damper and people call and they say, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm on a dog walk. And they're like, didn't we just, weren't you just on a dog walk? And I'm like, yeah, I do like 400 dog walks a day because that's the only thing there is for me to do is to talk on the phone and do a dog walk. So uh, so we, I think we can all relate. Uh, just a little bit for you to know, uh, and you may know some of this, but uh, the real estate industry composes about 9.5 million jobs. Um, that's composed of uh, real estate agents, uh, rental, the leasing industry, and for every two home sales, it generates one job in the country. Um, the issues that affect real estate, as I'm sure you know, are the issues that affect the nation and affect the economy. And so we appreciate uh, your diligence in, in always keeping the real estate industry in mind and how it plays back to the economy, not only at home uh, in, in your district, but in the entire state of South Carolina. And we urge you to consider all of those facts as you continue um, with uh, voting in DC on the next uh, several packages that could come out and everything else that's out there. Uh, we know that you've probably made difficult sacrifices during this time. I mean, clearly you're getting on a plane. A lot of America is afraid to get on a plane. And so uh, we applaud you for representing us and, and taking time and, and making the sacrifice. Well, happy to do it. That's, that's 
what we signed up for. Um, you know, it is a it is a challenging job, but our team has really done an incredible um, performance. You know, we're working very hard. We're working from home, but we're working harder than ever. And I've been so blessed. Um, you know, my my chief of staff and my team in D.C. and in Greenville and Spartanburg, we've all come together and helped help people that need help. And that's a very rewarding part of 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 what we do. And again, I'm just hoping that we can uh, get back open so um, I don't have to talk to people about unemployment anymore. And I don't have to, you know, talk to business owners who are wondering when they're going to be allowed to reopen. So, um, you know, the reopening's part of it, but um, the other part is getting people to believe that it's safe to go back out in public and r restart their lives. And, you know, th there's a lot of components to that, whether it's testing, social distancing, you know, washing your hands if you're older or sick, um, stay home as much as possible. You know, these are all the things that we're going to be talking about. But there is a new normal. And, um, you know, this is an opportunity for us to become more efficient uh, with technology and um, find find ways to be more efficient with our time and be more intentional with our time. So um, we're going to get through this together. And uh, I'm just excited to get back to work. Thank you. And the CARES Act has provided coronavirus relief to taxpayers and small businesses uh, across South Carolina, but it's been a very bumpy ride, to say the least. As we approach the end of the second round of funding, what do you think about the new plan, the speaker's plan that's been proposed, and what do you think will happen, and what will be next? Well, I guess we had to vote on something in the House. Um, the HEROES <laughs> Act, three, three plus trillion dollars of spending plus uh, a proxy uh, voting, uh, a new house rule that will allow for proxy voting. I don't know if these were very well thought out policies. Um, I'm, I wish that this had been more intentional. You know, the CARES Act did a lot of good things, but there were a, a lot of uh, hurried policies that we're seeing uh, create problems now. So this next package, whatever it is, however big it is, it needs to be intentional. It needs to provide relief exclusively to people that are, are, are affected by uh, COVID-19. This is not a free for all, we're gonna reshape the country, we're gonna reshape you know, the relationship between the state and the federal government. This is how do we get relief to the people that have been adversely affected by COVID-19? How do we make our society safer? Those are the conversations we should be having. And the, the two, two things we're voting on tomorrow, it was just not very well thought out. And obviously it's not gonna get any, they're not even going to talk about it in the Senate. It's it's um, a, a non-issue. So, um, you know, there'll be a party line vote. I'd, I'd be surprised if some of these Democrats even vote for it. Um, you know, it's just reckless spending. It's it is a wish list of of, of the speaker's policies. Uh, I just I wish that we were talking about how to help people and not how to reshape the country in their view. Um, so no, I, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. But maybe bits and pieces of it have potential. But um, yeah, we need to help people that have been adversely affected by COVID-19, and that's it. And that is the purpose of the next um, the next package. And I'm hopeful that we can start meaningful conversations after this vote tomorrow. I, I want to take a moment to let everyone watching know um, about the support that you have offered. Um, and that comes with your co-sponsorship of HR uh, 6463. Um, and I have this written on my computer screen. I've said it a dozen times because I love how everyone gets really long names for all bills, but securing and enabling commerce using remote and electronic notarization act of 2020, which is remote notary. And for those that are watching, and, and as you know, we've tried for quite some time in the general assembly to get that out um, in South, South Carolina and have been unable. And we appreciate you being a co-sponsor. Is there something you'd like to tell us about that bill and why you felt that was a, an important thing? Sure. I mean, you know, COVID-19, a lot of terrible things have happened in our society because of it, but there's also opportunities in that adversity. And um, any challenges that y'all previously had in getting this passed, um, I imagine they're going to be, uh, you know, a thing, a, a thing of uh, history because everyone wants to be able to continue operating. Um, and the, the theory that you would have to go to a bank or go somewhere to the attorney's office and get a document notarized is, is just uh, incomprehensible right now. So uh, I think this is a no-brainer. I think that COVID-19 will get this across the finish line. And um, I, I hope that it can pass really in the next weeks and months. 
again, we thank you for your support on that. Um, we believe it's a tremendous asset to not only the real estate industry, but but to anyone who needs a document notarized. Absolutely. Absolutely. It'll, it, it'll make uh, everyone's life easier. And um, I'm in the South Carolina Air National Guard, and I actually just became a, a notary not a month or two ago. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to never having to use that. <laughs> never, never putting your stamp on anything. <laughs> well, we thank you for that. Um, the CARES Act provides relief to families through the mortgage forbearance to ensure both homeowners and renters keep, maintain a roof, roofs over their heads during this crisis. Policymakers chose to respond and make the mortgage servicers responsible for delivering these government mandated benefits but the scale of the program could not have been foreseen by the mortgage servicers or anticipated by the regulators. As a result, uh, the required credit scores have increased for getting a mortgage and so has the down payment requirements for many lenders. And that's making homeownership a little less accessible to the working class in South Carolina. We're asking Congress to provide the final piece of the puzzle a liquidity facility for single family and multifamily servicers to ensure that the entire industry can deliver much needed economic relief to consumers. Do you think Congress can act or will act in time to help keep uh, mortgages accessible? There's so many areas that are affected by the economic uh, downturn as a result of COVID-19 and, you know, free markets will uh, react in ways and if the government steps in and encourages them to take different uh, approaches, that's definitely an option. Um, you know, the, the Fed has opened up several lending facilities in response to this crisis. This could be yet another one. Being on the Financial Services Committee in the House, uh, we have had these conversations. Um, you know, I just got an email this morning from a business owner where he said that his credit score has been adversely affected because he's requested forbearance for his car loans and, and his mortgage, and that shouldn't be the case. Um, credit scores are designed to be reflective of you know, a, a person's credit worthiness and their responsibility with their finances. And um, no one is responsible for COVID-19 uh, except maybe the Chinese. And I mean, you know, we're, we do not need to create challenges for small business owners, for uh, people that wanna purchase a home. You know, this should be part of the focus of the next package, and it's something that we will definitely be um, looking into for sure. One of the one of the pain points that has come out of everything um, has to do with uh, the protection of tenants, and it's very important to protect renters who have had a horrible economic disaster. Many tenants are in those jobs and in those industries that were completely shut down and 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 didn't have the ability to continue and didn't have reserves. Uh, many people live paycheck to paycheck in this country and in our state. Um, but a pain point that we're seeing is that when the tenant can't pay rent, um, many of our landlords, whether it be commercial or residential, can't pay their mortgage. Um, you know, so many people in South Carolina buy a home as part of their kind of retirement plan. And I'm going to sell this home uh, when I get ready to retire. And that's going to provide to that. Or, or I bought this commercial building and, and, and they're unable to make their payments. The, the biggest struggle that we're having is that uh, a renter who lives in a federally assisted property has 120 day eviction protection. But um, the landlord only gets a 90 day forbearance. Um, and then when you tack on um, stopping evictions in, in certain localities or municipalities or counties or, or what's happened in the state with eviction stopping, um, while it's not a rent holiday, um, you're still not providing, we're still not able to necessarily adequately provide some comfort level to the property owner. Is there anything that Congress can do to kind of level this out? You know, 20 days to stop a 20 days of 120 days of no eviction, but only 90 day forbearance on mortgage. So I've been referring to this as the great pause. The government stopped commerce, shut down the economy, told everyone to stay home to try to save lives. Um, I think everyone can agree we've definitely saved lives. The, 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 the wisdom and how we've done it is going to be discussed for decades. You know, dissertations will be written by thousands of PhD students on the response. So what is going to be in the next package? The next package needs to 
get us through the the next month, the next two months, and we got to get back to work. So, um, you know, when you provide forbearance to uh, renters or to people with mortgages, the the bank still has, uh, you know, it, it all goes upstream. And mm -hmm. when it goes to the very top, if we don't provide solutions for all parts of this puzzle, it's going to come crashing down. And so we have to take all that into account. We need to be very specific with our response. We need to be very, we need to tailor it to just the people that need this help. And again, we got to get back open. The only thing that's going to fix this problem is reopening the economy. Everybody needs to remember that um, we had one of the best economies we've ever had prior to COVID-19 and we will get back there. It's just going to take um, a little bit of time and we need to be patient. We need to be intentional with our policies at the state and federal level to get us back to, to where we were before. So. Um, we need to make sure that everyone is uh, able to weather the storm and uh, that, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't go upstream to, to, to where the, the dominoes fall. We just got to make sure that we get through it and we got to, everybody's got to be in a good position going forward. Yeah, understood. Absolutely. Um, speaking of forbearance, um, many homeowners have, have, been provided forbearance, but they're going to still be responsible for making those mortgage payments in the future. Uh, many, many families in the country have been affected financially um, by the COVID-19 virus. And the services of housing counselors were, are going to be more valuable than ever. It'd be great if Congress could increase funding for these vital services to the end providers. What are your thoughts on this? So I've I've had a number of these uh, calls with uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie, the, the Fed, all these different entities that are part of this conversation. I think it's important that first we talk about what forbearance is. Forbearance is not three months of no payments and then one big payment after that. Um, you can either tack it on to the end of the, the mortgage or of the lease agreement, or you can spread it across the remainder of the term. Um, we need to all work together to, to, to find a path forward and needs to be reasonable. So um, I, I do think that the federal government has an important role where anyone that has a, a, a lease or a mortgage that the, the note holder or the leaseholder says, you need, you, we'll give you three months of forbearance, but you got to pay it all at the end of the, the 90 day period. Um, please call our office. I'd be, I'd be happy to, to, to talk to whoever is telling you that because that is not a reasonable uh, solution to this problem. Um, so, you know, if we need to provide additional resources to help people that are trying to purchase homes um, to understand what they're getting into and the challenges and the, uh, the cost benefit analysis, I think that's reasonable. But I think the most important thing is to get people the relief they need right now to uh, allow them to um, get back to work. Thank you. I, I think that it's, it's a wonderful sentiment uh, to know that uh, an elected official understands both sides of the philosophy and, and isn't trying to create a liquidity issue and is trying to ensure that, that, that the constituent is, is taken care of. Um, in that vein, uh, the Realtors support HR 5377 and its companion bill in the Senate, which is 3178, um, and that involves SALT. Um, the penalty, the marriage penalty tax. Um, so as you know, uh, married couples who file jointly um, are only allowed to deduct 10,000 in state and local taxes. That's the same deduct, deduction allowed as if you're filing uh, single um, and uh, not joint. Um, NAR believes that by increasing uh, that deduction to 20,000, it would bridge the gap. It affects many middle-class families across the nation and, and in the state of South Carolina. Um, do you have any feelings or opinions on SALT um, and trying to find a happy medium at the 20,000 level, going up from 10 from married filing jointly to 20? You know, I, I think there's a lot of people that are going to try to use COVID-19 as a, as a way to uh, address ancillary issues. And, you know, the SALT uh, deductions were argued in the last uh, tax reform package, and there's good good and bad arguments on both sides of that. Um, I'm very wary of any uh, federal action during this crisis that will alleviate um, decades of poor policies in certain states from you know 
being bailed out. Um, I, I think that we need to address COVID-19. We need to address the coronavirus and, and, and get people relief that they need. Um, you know, if California wants to, you know, spend all, all of its grand, kids and grandkids money, that's fine. If Illinois, if New York, if New Jersey want to spend a bunch of money they don't have, don't come to D.C. and ask for money to bail out your poor policies in the midst of a crisis. Um, if they want to do that after the crisis is over, we can talk about it. I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, friendly ears uh, in D.C., but um, uh, again, these policies need to be addressed in an intentional way. And to try to bring up things that are not directly related to COVID-19 in the next package is just irresponsible. But um, I guess reasonable minds can differ on that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, speaking of a little bit of tax reform, uh, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, there was a dramatic increase in the purchase of single family homes offered as rental versus as purchase. And this has really limited the inventory, especially for first time home buyers. We support a provision uh, to provide non corporate owners of single family homes and condos one half reduction in their co current capital gains rate if they're selling to a buyer who would buy it as their, as their residence. We encourage uh, Congress to offer additional tax incentive to home buyers who plan to live in the houses they purchase. Do you think this will be able to come up in the near future? Something we can address? I, I think that's something that should definitely be looked into. Um, but again, we're in a, a, a crisis, you know, COVID-19. We got we to gotta find policies that will get our economy back open. Um, I, I think any non-essential legislation um, is something that will be delayed until after this is over. Um, we are in what is could very well be one of the biggest challenges of this generation, and we need to be strategic and thoughtful about the policies that we put into place and make them only related to this, because the second we start talking about um, other issues, it, it, it confuses kind of the purpose of it. Um, and I guess I'd also like to plug, when I got to Congress, we had $22 trillion worth of debt. Now we're at $25 trillion. I'll be the first to say now is not the time to talk about debt, um, but we are running out of, uh, you know, the ability to, to, to continue bailing things out. And um, the, the federal government needs to balance its, uh, its checkbook and needs to get some financial solvency. Um, if, we, if we find out as a country what our credit limit is, it will be extremely, extremely bad. It'll be far worse than COVID-19. Um, we need to be strategic and intentional about how we provide the economic relief to get our, our country back open. And then we have to sit down and have a serious conversation about uh, the role of the federal government, uh, taxes and social safety, social safety net programs, all of these things, but defense spending. I'm not, I'm not leaving anything off the table. Um, we cannot, if we have 40 or $50 trillion worth of debt, which we very well may if we don't change things in the next decade, um, that will be really, really bad. And we need to be responsible and find a path um, forward that, uh, we can all we can all agree on. Thank you. Uh, changing direction a little bit. Um, I think this is kind of a timely topic that the Realtor Association has has been advocating for 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 years now, and and that's um, association health plans. Um, I think now more than ever, people are thinking about their insurance or their lack of insurance, um, medical visits, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, the National Association of Realtors has advocated for. A, um, association health plans for years. Um, nearly two thirds of our membership um, derive their health care from either a spouse, Medicaid, or the Affordable Health Care Act. As independent contractors, uh, we don't have that luxury of being on a group plan um, for the most part uh, and, and out there functioning. We believe that a association health care plan will provide a, a higher quality, lower cost um, ability to ensure more people. Um, is there anything you can do to help us with that? I know it's been a it's been a topic in the administration. Um, it's come up in some regulatory conversations, but we still haven't seen that movement yet to allow for the association health plans. I think it's a great it's a great option to provide uh, your members, and it's something I could definitely support. the The, the challenge is the the state of healthcare in our country is in turmoil. Uh, this is you know, pre-COVID-19, we were in a very bad, bad place. 
cost of healthcare was going up, quality of healthcare was going down. Um, we just have some incentives uh, with competing incentives that we need to align all the different areas of the healthcare industries uh, in, in, into making our society healthy and capable and everybody wants to be contributing. We got to make sure they're able to do that. So um, there's a larger conversation surrounding healthcare that I think needs to happen. And um, right now we're just so hyperpartisan and divided that, that I don't know. It's tough to, to clean up certain areas because then you're going to be leaving out others. Um, you know, prior to COVID-19, we had drug pricing conversations um, that, that seem to be moving along. Um, you know, there's a number of areas that I do think that there's some, some bipartisan support. But again, the second you do anything on healthcare, any change you make, you're opening up a can of worms and um, everybody wants to put everything else in it. So while I would support it, I'm not as optimistic about um, our ability to get that done this year, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, we, we appreciate the opportunity to have the conversation when it when it's a relevant time. That's right. That's right. Okay, now to infrastructure. Um, there's been some talk about uh, infrastructure being included in a relief package to stimulate economic development. The FAST Act expires in September. Um, is there any, is there, what's next for that FAST Act? Is there any chance that it could include necessary broadband and broadband investments for South Carolina's rural communities? You know, we have children who need to be able to study online and they don't have that ability uh, from their home. And this could really help with folks working from home and homeschooling at this time. Sure, so I've been talking a lot about infrastructure in the last couple of weeks. I, I do think that there is a, a place for that in the, in the coming weeks and months. Um, you know, we just spent three trillion, two, three, four, five trillion dollars, depending on how you look at it. Um, we, we can't keep giving away money we don't have the balance sheet to do it so what can we do that would be that would achieve our objective that uh, achieve our objective of getting people back to work helping spur economic growth um, but is not uh, free money and that's an investment in infrastructure so um, i think that a lot of the conversations previously surrounding this were how do you pay for it and it was coming up you know we could find a way to pay for 50 percent of it but it was still an unfunded uh, deficit expander so um, I think people are less concerned about deficit spending right now. Um, that's not to say that we shouldn't be next year and after COVID-19, but I think right now, if the government wants to spend a trillion dollars plus on uh, an infrastructure package that has broadband, that has roads and bridges and water and all these different areas, um, that puts people back to work. And there is a massive return on that. A lot of it, there's an immediate return. So those are the kind of conversations we should be having. Not, you know, let's give everybody, you know, $2,000 a month for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, that will bankrupt our country, but spending a trillion dollars and only finding a way to pay for half of it um, during this crisis is a reasonable path forward that will uh, put people back to work, that will make a return, allow us to grow our economy and help us get out of this problem as opposed to getting us into a worse situation than we are. Uh, thank you, Representative Timmons. Um, Kind of like a. This is kind of like a. What do you What do you think is kind of uh, what our what our members in the state want to hear? You know, I think a lot of people are living in fear. Uh, they're they're afraid to go out to dinner, or they're not comfortable yet. Uh, they're not. We're not seeing the stores as full as as they could be within line of social distancing and best practices under the CDC and and the White House reopening plan. Uh, what do you think will ease those fears and restore some American confidence and, and frankly, confidence in South Carolinians uh, to kind of uh, boost the economy back? So we got to get better at testing. We got to get uh, better antibody testing. We got to build up a, a supply of ventilators. The medical community has been doing their best to, to be prepared for this going forward, obviously there's a vaccine coming in you know, six to 18 months. Um, those are all variables, but I think it's important. South Carolina needs to remember that we've had 300 plus deaths and we put 400,000 people out of work. I don't know many people that think that's a good equation. Um, so, you know, let's just look at New York City, worst, worst hit area in, in the country in the world. Um, the, the death rate for a zero to 18 year old was 0 0.00001. Um, so why are we keeping schools shut down when you know we're talking about 
the risk is so small. And then you look at the 18 to 45 and, uh, you know, 10 out of 100,000 people in New York City have died from coronavirus. So these are the conversations we need to have. These are the numbers we need to look at. And then you say, OK, so you're over 60. You're you're not well. You, you have underlying health conditions. Um, Y'all need to take those. That group of people need, need needs to take additional precautions. Um, but we have to reopen. The federal government is out of money. We can't keep spending money. We don't have um, the great pause worked. We have saved lives. That's fantastic. Um, but we need to reopen. We got to reopen safely and responsibly. But um, the only thing that will, will will get us where we need to be is uh, a reopening of the economy. Um, it's there's just no way around it. So I'm going to do everything I can to push in that direction while also taking the precautions necessary to to protect those that need protection and to help everybody get through this. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm curious, do you by any way have any st statistic on the CARES Act funding and how much may have gone to the real estate sector in South Carolina or across the U.S.? Are those numbers available? Um, not specific to the real estate, but you know, a lot of the challenges at the outset, a lot of people were upset that some of these larger businesses were, were taking advantage of PPP loans. And um, you know, I've always said Ruth's Chris or the mom and pop store downtown Greenville, um, the, the person that's serving tables and, and you know, cleaning up, uh, they're no different. So uh, it's the payroll protection program. Um, you know, so I, I think that it's important to realize the goal was to keep people off the unemployment rolls and uh, it was an overwhelming success. Um, the other thing to mention is that the average loan was less than $75,000. So, um, you know, this went to the people that needed it most. This went to small businesses. And um, again, it was only a short term fix. It's only a couple of weeks. Um, and the only thing that will truly help these businesses is to reopen. And there's a lot of challenges with the payroll protection program. Uh, you know, my business, Swamp Rabbit CrossFit, uh, we're in a situation where we're allowed to open on Monday. And we initially did furlough people because um, we had revenue disruption. But now that we are allowed to reopen, we don't know if there's revenue on the other side of that. And we got a PPP loan. And that money, um, if we want to fully abide by the rules, we'd have to bring back all the people that are currently on unemployment, making $926 a week. So we're put between their best interest, which is to remain on unemployment as long as the additional $600 a week is there. Um, so we're going to give a lot of the money back for the PPP loan because we're going to do what's in the best interest of our team. Um, that said, that money runs out in a couple of weeks, so we'll bring everybody back then, but that's not going to be PPP eligible at that point. So, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, competing, in, uh, competing interests here. And business owners, restaurants particularly, are going to have major challenges. Um, you know, if, if you are just allowed to reopen at 25% capacity, are you going to get 25% rent? I don't think so. Um, so, you know, your costs are still there. And when you tell somebody that they can only, you know, they have to reduce their capacity, they're not going to be able to make the math work. So, um, again, we got to reopen. We got to do it safely. We got to do it responsibly. But, um, the CARES Act did a lot of good, and some of it was a little bit hurried and wasn't thought through. So I do think this phase four package, uh, the Senate will take a lot of time, and they will be very intentional about getting relief exclusively to those that need it and not allowing people to abuse this crisis and um, take advantage of it. So I'm, I'm hopeful that they will uh, really make a, a big impact, and we'll get back to work here in the next couple of weeks. Thank you, Congressman. I, we don't want to hold you from making your plane, so uh, we'll kind of wrap it up. Any kind of final thoughts for our realtor members? So, uh, you know, I just really appreciate y'all taking the time to to touch base. We're working hard in D.C. Uh, you know, this has been a huge challenge, a huge crisis. It's affected certain people far more. So we got to just remember that there's 40 million people in this country that are, are unemployed right now, and they're hurting. They're they're worried about how they're going to feed their feed their kids, how they're going to pay their mortgage, how they're going to make their car payment. Um, you know, we need to do everything we can to help them. They didn't do anything wrong. Um, COVID nineteen is a, a, a massive challenge as a society, and we need to be very intentional about getting relief to those that need it. And um, you know, that's the most important thing we can do. And just 
take the precautions you need, wash your hands all the time, wear a mask uh, as, as much as you can and social distance. Um, you know, I'm actually not upset about no longer shaking hands. I'm, I, I shake so many <laughs> hands. I'm, I'm wondering what we're going to do. We've do. We've been doing the elbow bump. I think we may go to the Japanese bow, like what, whatever it is. I'm, there's, there's things that are, are terrible about COVID-19, but there's, there's always uh, opportunity you know, technology, we're speaking to, you know, hundreds of people right now, and, and we couldn't do this if we were in the DC office in DC. So um, yeah. just take take the good with the bad and, and get through it and uh, try to learn from it. And just remember, this is never going to happen again. We will have the domestic production capacity. We're going to bring back so much foreign uh, supply chains. It's going to be uh, incredible for the Southeast in particular, uh, where manufacturing is already seeing, seeing a resurgence. So. Um, you know, we're going to get through it, but uh, just do everything you can to be as safe as possible as we reopen. So thank you and uh, hope to see you all in person soon. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Timmons. On behalf of Adair, myself and our 24,000 commercial and residential members uh, at South Carolina Association of Realtors, we appreciate your determination and dedication uh, during this current time and, and prior to COVID because it's hard to believe, but we did have a life eight weeks ago uh, that many of us are having a hard time remembering. Um, but we appreciate you always including us in the conversation. Your staff locally and your staff in DC are so great about reaching out, uh, sharing information. Uh, we enjoy working with them. Adair enjoys working with you and the staff. And we can't thank you enough for your dedication, not only to the real estate industry, but your constituents and, and everyone in the state of South Carolina. So thank you, safe travels, and, and wish you and your family all the best. Let me plug one more thing. Y'all have a fantastic team in DC. I actually talked to Joe Harris earlier today. He's uh, part of your federal government affairs team and Shannon McGann is incredible. So um, I've really enjoyed working with them. They represent y'all's interest uh, very, very well. So thank y'all for having a great team there. And thank you for having a great team here. We're working hard. Y'all are working hard and, um, you know, we're going to do big things. So y'all be safe and hope to see you soon. I can tell you, you're one of Joe's favorite people. <laughs> he loves to tell a law school story. <laughs> None of those are true. None of those are true. <laughs> All right. Y'all take Thank care. Thank you so much, Representative Timmons. Have a safe flight and we appreciate your time today. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you.